Hey y'all, it's Barry. I'm here today to give you our unit four summary, momentum, impulse, and collisions. So we're going to get right to it. We're going to get right into it. We're going to start by defining momentum. So first, momentum is defined as mass in motion. We think about that term, those three words there together, mass in motion implies a mass with a velocity. Okay, that's really what we're looking at. Not really, it's exactly what we're looking at. So momentum here, represented by a P, is going to be mass M in motion V for velocity. Okay, so when we have a velocity applied to a mass, we have momentum. Simple as that. Now, really what we're going to be interested in with this unit is when momentum changes. That's the most uh, important thing to analyze, really. So changing momentum requires changing one of those input quantities. So in order for momentum to change, we need either the mass or the velocity to change. So an example that we could look at is when someone's driving down the road. Now, while I do not recommend this first one, do not litter, um, if you have some amount of mass leaving a vehicle, then you have a change in the mass, and that potentially will change the momentum, right? So given the same velocity, less mass will be less momentum. And we see that quantity here represented, right, how that, that change in one uh, variable would represent a change in the overall quantity. We could also step on that gas, and that's acceleration. We've looked at how acceleration affects motion in the past, but accelerating is certainly going to increase velocity and thus will also increase momentum, okay? Now, between the two of these, one is much more common and happens much more often. So it's more likely to have a change in velocity than a change in mass. And typically when we refer to a change in momentum, we're referring to a change in momentum because there is a change in velocity. It's less often that you have a change in mass for an object that's already moving. And so this is really what we're gonna be representing more than anything else. Now, what's causing a change in momentum typically is an impulse. And an impulse is going to be defined as a, a collision as well. And we're going to get a lot more into collisions. But a, an impulse and a collision happen essentially simultaneously. Um, this happens when a force is applied for some amount of time in order to change the momentum. So we see a force applied for some amount of time. That equals our momentum change that we just looked at in the previous slide. And that's our delta P right there. Okay, So a change in momentum, to take this backwards... Change in momentum causes a velocity change of some mass, and that happens typically because a force is applied for some amount of time. So you could have a football tackle right here, right, where this running back would have momentum as they're moving, and that momentum is going to change certainly without their mass changing, unless they fumble, but we're going to assume that they don't. Without their mass changing, they have some force applied from the tackler for some amount of time, and that's causing a change in their velocity. Same type thing when you have a baseball right here, right? So a baseball moving to the left, so in the negative x direction, once it's hit by a baseball bat, it's going to certainly have a force applied for a very small amount of time and thus have a very drastic change in velocity, and, and that's going to be a very large impulse in that case. And of course, I've got my NC State football player tackling the UNC football player and my favorite baseball player growing up, Barry Larkin from the Cincinnati Reds. Sorry for the bias there. All right, moving on. Um, impulses will certainly change momentum, and I want to look at how that can vary uh, amongst the impulse. So we have two cases here. We got this poor kid, and he just doesn't see the wall. All right, and he's just running and running and running. And what we've got is one case in case A where there is no mat on the wall. And another case in case B where there is a mat on the wall. And if you've noticed, if you've ever been to a gym, there are typically mats behind a, a basketball hoop. And this is because what that does is it increases the amount of time that the collision happens. When you hit the mat versus and then all the way that it takes, the amount of time that it takes for it to compress before you hit the wall, that time is going to be greater than if you just hit the wall on its own. And so the compression of the mat is helping increase the time here and thus will decrease the force applied to the person. And this is why a mat like that makes the impact or the collision or the impulse um, less force uh, applied to the person who's undergoing the impulse. All right, um, we do have conservation of momentum in the same way we had conservation of energy, and they're actually a little tied together, and we'll get to that coming up here also. But momentum transfers during an impulse, but it is conserved. And you see an example here, and if you need to pause and kind of look through the numbers, no problem. But um, in the absence of an external force like gravity or friction, and that's important to note, we are assuming here that we have no friction loss or anything else like that in these types of collisions in order for momentum to be conserved. The total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. So we have a larger truck hitting a smaller car and the truck is going faster. The truck ends up slowing down after the collision and the car speeds up. And we see the math here again to back that up. 
Now, two types of collisions that we're really going to be concerned with. There's an in-between, and I'll mention that quickly also, but there's two what we consider perfect types of collisions, and those are the big ones that we want to analyze. So an impulse happens during a collision, and that's really important to note. Okay, so a force is applied for some amount of time, and that's what causes the collision to happen. That's what our impulse is. But first, we have elastic objects that perfectly bounce off each other. So we see an example over here of an elastic object, a tennis ball coming into the wall, bouncing back out. It has the same velocity in and out because we have a perfectly elastic collision. Okay, now an inelastic collision is when two objects stick together and then travel as one, typically travel as one. In the case here of an object, a clay object or a piece of a Play-Doh or something being thrown at a wall, it's gonna stick and there's no final velocity because the wall is immobile. If it wasn't, then the two would stick together and travel together, okay? So elastic, perfectly bounce off each other. They, they continue on without anything happening there. Inelastic, they stick together and then continue or fail to continue as one. Now in the middle, you'll see partially either partially elastic or partially inelastic or just partial um, collisions. And that really means that there's some amount of both, okay? And typically that refers to deformation or breaking. If you were to throw an egg at this wall, egg is going to crack apart and break and go all over the place. That would be a partial collision. Um, probably more partial inelastic because parts of it would stick to the wall. Whereas if you were to throw... Um, something else where there'd be part of it that would stick and most and some of it that would come off, we'd have a partially elastic collision, okay? Now, energy is present in collisions as well, and it's going to be present in different ways depending on those two different types of collisions. So in an elastic collision, and one of the most common examples is playing pool. So you see the pool balls right here. In an elastic collision, all energy, specifically the kinetic energy, is conserved. So the total momentum before will equal the total momentum after. That's our conservation there. And you see this little apostrophe here. This just denotes the velocity of A before without it and the velocity of A after with it. And the masses are going to remain the same as we talked about. Now, in this case, in an elastic, the total kinetic energy before will also equal the total kinetic energy after. And that's really helpful because that gives us two equations potentially to help solve for some of these quantities. So that makes solving for them a lot easier. We can solve simultaneous um, equations in that case. Now, in an inelastic collision, some amount of energy is going to be lost. And this happens either during coupling or deformation or, or the pairing of these objects together. Okay, so in the case here of train cars, as a very common example in physics for an inelastic collision, train cars come together, they couple, and then travel as one. And that would be an inelastic collision because two masses that potentially were traveling, one was moving, one wasn't, whatever, have that collision, that impulse, it's in an inelastic collision, and then they travel as one. But there's some amount of energy lost in this coupling here, in these pieces hooking together. Um, in the case here of an arrow, Let's say this target was able to move. It was able to fall over. It was able to travel once the arrow hit it. In the case of this arrow going into the target, you see all these little holes here, some amount of energy is lost. So all of the energy in this case, specifically the kinetic energy, is not going to be conserved. Some is going to be lost. So we cannot use this kinetic energy equation here. We can assume that the momentum is conserved, but not the energy in an inelastic collision. And, in, and once again, it, when we have an elastic collision, both are conserved. Um, so again, to go a little more in depth into an elastic collision, we see our equation up here that we just saw on the previous slide. There is a quick example here. And so we see a 0.2 kilogram ball that's moving at five meters per second. It catches up and hits this 0.3 larger kilogram ball that's moving to two meters per second. We have our collision here. It will be an elastic collision because they travel on afterwards without any deformation and without pairing. So the smaller one that's still 0.2 kil uh, kilograms is moving at 1.5 meters per second after. We want to know the velocity of the larger ball after the collision. So we've got our two balls colliding as shown above. What is the velocity of the larger ball? And you see the equation right above. I want you to pause, take about three minutes, try to solve that real quick. And then uh, when you come back, I'll tell you the answer. All right, now that you've had a chance to pause and work that one out, we're going to have 4 and 1 third, 4.33, however you kind of write that down, whether you're a fraction or a decimal person. Um, we have 4 and a third meters per second for the, the velocity of in mass 2 after the collision. Now, going on to an inelastic collision example. Again, we have our masses before the collision with some velocities. Um, potentially, if there's a zero here, then it's just going to cancel a term out. But we're going to have them combine after the collision and then move together with some common velocity. And we see the example right here where one will cancel out. The momentum here, M2V2I, that initial, 
for this second one that's at rest will be zero. So that one will just cancel out and we'll only be looking at this momentum before and then the momentum of both combined after the collision. So again here, we have a larger mass, six meters per second. It's a four kilogram mass moving at six meters per second. Hits a smaller one that's at rest. They stick and thus we have an inelastic collision. So the two balls collide and move as shown. Um, and then move afterwards. We want to know the velocity of the balls after the collision here once they're combined. So again, pause briefly and then uh, we'll come back to this and I'll give you the answer there. All right, now that you're back from that one too, um, hopefully if you plugged in all your numbers right here, we got four meters per second for the final velocity of the two balls combined right there. All right. Finally, we need to look at momentum in two dimensions. And what we've really got here is we're going to have two masses that come together, potentially in one dimension here. They're going to be offset to some degree or they would continue to travel in one dimension. So this one might be just a little bit above it. And then that's why one moves up and one moves down. You could have two collide from angles and then move off at angles. And here, we're doing the same thing. We're applying the same concepts, which is why I'm not focusing on this anymore right now. The important part is that we need to realize that conservation still happens, but it happens in the um, dimensional analyses by themselves. So all of the X momentum beforehand here will be the same after. It is conserved in the X direction, the horizontal direction. And all of the Y momentum that's here before will be conserved and thus will be the same after as well. Now, the important thing here is we see there's no vertical momentum before and this before for this collision. That doesn't mean that there's not some after. The combined after will be zero. So there's no momentum in the Y direction before this collision. But after the mass one has a positive Y momentum, mass two has a negative Y momentum. Those two will be equal and opposite. They will essentially cancel out overall, and thus we still have conservation of momentum. Okay, and we'll work a lot of examples of that in class. Uh, that's what I've got today, so thanks for being here.